So this is a facility to provide for a very specific set of needs. And I want to talk first about our overall strategy. The first and most important strategy is to prevent infection from happening. And so that's why I start with chiding you about social distancing or physical distancing. Uh, there is no substitute for avoiding becoming infected in the first place or preventing yourself from infecting others. Uh, everything after that is uh, very uh, resource intensive, labor intensive, and uh, can be extremely dangerous. Uh, the second thing we need to do is prevent our hospitals from being overwhelmed. This has been a tragedy you've seen unfold in Italy and other places in this country and around the world where uh, the hospitals have so many patients who need acute care that they cannot care for them. They don't have the personnel, they don't have the rooms, they don't have the equipment. We are determined to fight against that. We do not want that to happen here in our community and that's what this facility is about. So you may have heard about different properties, different types of buildings that we're standing up across King County. Some of them are for isolation and for quarantine. Uh, those might have individual rooms, they might be hotels, they might be modular uh, 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 setups that we've placed on public land around the county. Uh, there is a slightly different set of needs that we want to address in, uh, in having a place for assessment and recovery. And that's what this place here in Shoreline is about. This is a place where uh, we will be able to bring folks and they can be assessed to find out what symptoms they have, to be tested potentially, ultimately uh, to be able to figure out if they can uh, leave here or whether they need to move to the recovery side of the house and wait for their symptoms uh, to go away and for them to no longer be contagious. Uh, that is uh, a tall order. It is an order that requires facilities on this scale, and I couldn't be prouder of our partners who have helped to make this happen. Uh, the city of Shoreline has been truly remarkable here. Uh, they stepped up, they said we want to help. They helped with this uh, great public facility here, and they've been extremely cooperative and, and helpful all along the way, and there have been many others. Uh, you know, we're grateful to the support of Amazon. Amazon has been helping out a lot in our community, and there are folks here who can speak to the help that we've gotten from our corporate partners generally to Alaska Airlines. Uh, Alaska's helped in a lot of different ways, including contributing funding to the Seattle Foundation project that Amazon's also contributed to. But they, just yesterday, provided us with a shipment of hundreds of those uh, digital media players that you get on the airplane that folks can use while they're in quarantine or isolation or awaiting their test results to keep themselves entertained uh, and informed uh, and uh, it'll make the time pass a little more quickly and we're grateful to Alaska Airlines and to Fair Start. Fair Start is the nonprofit organization that trains people who had barriers to employment to become cooks, to become chefs, to become employable in the restaurant industry and they are providing meals, uh, hundreds and in fact thousands of meals that will help us keep everyone fed. and not to be left out, the Duval Distillery, which will be providing not their regular product, but hand sanitizer. Uh, they have shifted their operations, as have many distilleries, to producing hand sanitizer, and they just showed up at our Issaquah location uh, with a big shipment of sanitizers, uh, sanitizer to help people out there. So today, as I mentioned, we're in Shoreline. And this is the first of our planned, what are called assessment and recovery centers, uh, or ACRC for those who need an acronym. Uh, this will be a congregate recovery site. It will have on-site doctors, it will have on-site nurses. It will be ready to respond uh, when and if there is a surge in demand for people to be uh, screened, to be assessed, and to have a place outside of a hospital environment to recover because remember those hospital beds are the precious resource and we have to keep them available for the people who need the acute care. Health care will be available here. Behavioral health care will be available here. Uh, a recovery site like this, of course, also gives hospitals the option if they need to move someone out of a hospital bed who doesn't really need to be there into a site where they can receive the appropriate level of care, this site can be available for that purpose. And we know that most people who get this illness 
uh, some 80% will have uh, mild or even no symptoms. And that is a good thing, but for the 20% who become very ill or critically ill, we have to maintain the capacity of our system to be able to provide them the, health, the help they need to return to health. That includes the people who are most vulnerable, and I will exhort you again to help us in protecting the elders, the grandparents, those who have underlying health conditions, weakened immune systems. We have to figure out how each of us can avoid becoming infected and infecting others if we're all going to get through this together. Our individual actions, whether or not we're in a high-risk group, will save lives. And we're, we are proud that our community has pulled together to stand up a facility like this to be able to help ensure that everyone is able to get through this together. When we're talking about this facility, uh, we've really designed this. Uh, the executive was clear that we needed to be ready to step in at a congregate emergency level if we had large numbers of people who needed to go to a hospital setting. And so that's what this facility does that's really different. This is where you could bring not one or two people, but a group of 20 people from a shelter, uh, from an emergency room, from a community. They could come here, get assessed on site. Uh, for folks that it's uh, the right intervention, we'll be able to keep them here to recover. From folks who it turns out are not uh, positive for COVID-19, we'll be able to return them to the community from here. Leo, this is not a walk up though. I, I guess, I mean, yeah, yeah can you talk about it. We mean, just discussed you're that. You're not expecting a bunch of people to come here. They got to go somewhere else first, right? No, this is not a walk-up facility. Uh, I think the thing that we see is that most people in our community have good access to healthcare. Uh, they have the ability to do all of the directions that Patty and her colleagues have directed us, which is, you know, call the nurse, call the hospital before you go. Not everybody has access to that level of care or can afford that level of care. And so this is a place where you can call uh, the COVID hotline that the county is operating. Uh, you can make contact with uh, both the homelessness uh, providers that work out of the county and the public health providers and say we have a large uh, potential cluster in a place where we live or work uh, what should we do and rather than identifying individuals uh, we can arrange to have those groups of people brought here uh, we have partners at King County Metro who have outfitted and retrofitted uh, uh, small buses to be able to move larger groups of people here so that they can be assessed and then recover as that's appropriate Absolutely. So, uh, within the so the question was behavioral health. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing is essential to the ability of people to succeed in isolation, quarantine, and in a setting like this, is that we can provide for their behavioral health needs, both mental health and substance abuse needs. And so, the uh, first step that we took is to make sure that we have constant presence of behavioral health uh, professionals who can do a crisis intervention if that's necessary talk to somebody, understand their needs, and then the piece that we are bringing online into all of our facilities now is the partnership with our local providers. Uh, in King County, we have a strong network of local providers who provide behavioral health care persistently for folks who are not only in crisis, but throughout uh, the day and throughout the, the week, and we are bringing them into this uh, effort as well so that you can get the immediate on-site crisis intervention. And then if it's necessary, we can bring to bear the ability of your uh, normal Medicaid-funded provider so that they can provide on-site behavioral health care as well. Does that include them and Suboxone We absolutely have the ability to, to bring uh, uh, opiate users into the facilities and then make a determination about whether uh, they have an ongoing course of treatment. And if they do, we're going to work with their current provider to maintain that course of treatment. We've worked with the state to ensure that we have the ability to uh, modify the amount of methadone that a person might be able to receive all, uh, and, and responsibly uh, continue to use uh, that methadone as part of their treatment and then we also have the ability uh, to do new assessments on site and connect people with uh, care if they're not currently in it. The question is in selecting sites around the county do we apply a, an equity or, or a racial justice lens and the answer is yes we have a we have a, a screen that we go through to identify whether there are disparate impacts uh, to the extent there are impacts based on where a facility is located. Uh, I would uh, contest your assertion that most of the isolation quarantine facilities are uh, in uh, communities of color or in lower income communities. We have a, a hotel in Issaquah uh, that is opening up, I believe is, is ready now, okay. ready, ready to go. Uh, we're here in Shoreline today uh, we are making an effort 
to have facilities across the entire county. It is a fact that there are more hotels in particular that are uh, vacant right now uh, in more outlying areas than in, in the uh, center of Seattle. But even in Seattle, we have a uh, warehouse, we have uh, units on Harbor Island we've set up, we have um, modular facilities on properties, on city properties, and we're looking at county properties as well. Uh, we are making every attempt to have the whole community uh, share the, the, uh, the facilities that are needed for us to get through this. So I appreciate your question. Yeah. The question is, what about keeping people there if they've tested positive? Uh, our public health officer, Jeff Duchin, uh, a couple days ago uh, issued a new order uh, that uh, directs people who are showing symptoms and have been tested and are awaiting testing to remain in quarantine. Quarantine is when you don't know you're sick, you're just waiting to find out and you're avoiding potentially infecting others. And ordered people who have tested positive to stay in isolation until a certain period of time has passed uh, following both the identification of the illness and the last symptoms. Uh, he has the authority, as he says in his order, to enforce that through court order and, if necessary, through having people who are not cooperating detained. For most people, that is not going to be uh, a challenge. And frankly, for most people, uh, they have the opportunity to stay in their own home, in their own yard. I, we we're talking about folks who don't have an alternative and trying to create a facility of spaces around the county where people can be for two weeks or even more uh, and have provided for them all the things they need. Will there be security to surround these facilities to enforce that order? There, there is going to be security at each facility. Each facility is not going to be surrounded with barbed wire. That is not how this works. Uh, because most people are going to be compliant and for those who are not, we're going to identify them individually and escalate that informing them that they are legally obligated to stay and if necessary uh, intervening with the, with the authority of the court. There will be no rounding up and bringing groups of people who do not want to come here uh, to this facility. Uh, as the executive mentioned, there is a health officer order that does order people who know that they have a positive test to isolate in a home of their own uh, or if they don't have one in a, in a publicly provided facility if one is available. Uh, but we are not going to be compelling somebody to come here. What we find instead is that through good relationships with the people who provide these services on a daily basis, we're able to identify who would benefit from a setting like this. Uh, and what we found is that the, ma the vast majority of people so far in the isolation quarantine system who we identify and provide the opportunity, they're uh, thankful to be able to come to a place where they can recover uh, safely. Now, just overall, does, uh, what does late January, mid early February Executive Constantine think of what has been accomplished here in the county over the yeah. last six weeks? Well, you know, when we first learned of the, the one case in Snohomish, we didn't know if it was isolated or not, but the behind the scenes plans that Patty and Public Health have been doing, Human Services really kicked into high gear. And a lot of this real estate work Tony's been doing started then. They stood up the, uh, the HMAC, the, the Public Health, uh, emergency headquarters, uh, we uh, began really rapidly planning, still not knowing uh, when this epidemic would hit our region, and then it turned out it hit us first. So everything we're planning on doing really ended up getting compressed in a very short period of time. I am so impressed with the county employees, with our community partners, with cities like Shoreline for stepping up and making something uh, really uh, uh, vast, uh, enormous, like this happened so quickly. Can you imagine if we subjected all of this kind of work to our famous and much beloved Seattle process? It would be years before we got this done. So I got to say that uh, the community has really stepped up in that spirit that we are all in this together, that we're caring for one another, and that we're willing to set aside whatever our individual agendas are to get it done uh, is really reassuring. And I, I, I hope that that's going to continue throughout what is going to be several months at least. Right now, we're looking still to help de-intensify uh, homeless shelters across the region. So you've got shelters not just in Seattle, but uh, all around the county on the east side and 
in South King County where people are too close together. And even if you're able to get them six feet apart, there's still a significant danger that an infection will take hold and spread through a shelter. So we're trying to find facilities where we can get those people separated, where the shelter operators can still operate it, because we are really short on personnel. Again, thank you, Kaiser Permanente, for standing up. Uh, and, and where we can then use those opportunities to prevent the, the, the virus from spreading in places where it really right now is most likely to spread, in the congregate settings, nursing homes, uh, uh, detention facilities, homeless shelters, those are the places we're most worried about. So we're going to keep working on creating new real estate opportunities that will allow us not just to help people recover, but to prevent the virus from spreading in the first place.